This is CX of M Radio, the voice of customer experience professionals. Welcome to another World of UX podcast. This is your host, Darren Hood. Thanks, everybody, for taking the time to join us on today. We hope to share something with you that will vault your career forward in the world of UX. Welcome to those of you who are joining us for the first time and best wishes, whatever stage you're in, in your user experience journey, uh, wishing everybody all the best. We are going to pick up, I've been calling this potpourri, and the more I look at the current topic it's 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 more of a an ode to new UXers uh what we talked about last week uh in talking about much needed traits um personality traits in particular today we're going to talk about another aspect of it I actually shook things up a bit so I'm I'm shifting some things uh and want to talk tonight to you about under the radar principles now we talked about traits personality traits most of which were associated with emotional intelligence. The things that I'm going to look at tonight and present to you, I should say on tonight, are really principles that help drive you forward and principles that help to a person to be more successful in their work. So there's traits, there's techniques, there's methods, there's methodologies there's deliverables. We have to deal with all these things, but they're also principles. They might be considered as something that are tied to the personality traits, but it's a little bit different. These are things that we need to do that simply do not come up when it comes to getting the work done. People want to talk about Figma. They want to talk about design thinking. They want to talk about research They want to talk about the work and people who talk about the work, as I talk about all the time, UX is about much more than the work. And if you only focus on the work and miss things like what I'm going to talk to you about tonight and what I talked about last week, you end up falling short. You end up not being able to to be as as successful as you could. So I I really hope that people will take this to heart, Uh, things that I've come to know to be true, things that are, these things are just absolutely critical and they should be on our radar. So let's get started. I have eight under the radar principles for UXers. And notice I'm not saying new UXers because it really applies to everybody, even though I'm sort of addressing new UXers and it's, it's still a potpourri in a, in a sense. But but folks, there are people who've been in UX for a, for a decade who don't have some of these things down pat. So, and it's really something we should never be ashamed. If if there's, if we find out there's an area in our lives that needs to be developed, so what? Go develop it. It doesn't mean you're any less of a person. It doesn't mean you're any less of a UXer. We're simply talking about going higher. We're simply talking about getting better. So here are eight under the radar principles for successful UXers. Number one, develop great attention to detail. Notice I said develop it. I didn't just say attention to detail. This is something, as we stated last week, this is something that can be learned. This is something that you can get better at. It's something that you can continue to sharpen the saw concerning. And and there are exercises that people can do to be better critical thinkers, which is a part of attention to detail in a sense. I didn't list critical thinking out there. If there's a, if there's a bonus element or principle, it it has to do with, with that today being a critical thinker. But when we give attention to detail, which is at the core of the user experience professionals, um, the, the, the persona, if you will, because, we're basically paid to be anal and anal is just the root word of analytic 
Uh, it's just a word, root word of analysis. Some people hear the word anal and they become afraid or they, they start going down a certain uh, a certain road, so to speak, mentally. It just simply means that we're very detail-oriented. So if you know that you've seen things that show that you lack attention to detail, if you see things that let you know that you need to focus a bit more, that you could be better at this, then engage in different exercises, do things that will help you pay more attention to detail. You can do things like watching a movie and calling certain things out, watching a movie multiple times so that you can pick up on things that you missed the time before. That's the kind of thing that can help you to exercise attention to detail, engage in people watching, pick up on little nuances of body language, facial expressions, That's why attention to detail is so important. It's not just within the work. It's not just attention to detail within the designs that we're looking at or that we're working on. When we just naturally have an attention to detail, it will flow naturally in our work. So, So I talk about focusing on it from a life perspective and then let it flow that way. If you if you focus solely on trying to develop and looking at it on the work side of things, you're going to be on a slower track to improvement is my opinion, my expert opinion in that. Develop attention to detail by paying attention to things you don't normally pay attention to. Make a deliberate attempt. Make a conscious attempt to improve at attention to detail in natural things, and you'll start to see it happen in your work, you'll pick up on things that you would not have a year ago. You'll pick up on on opportunities for improvement. It it really pays off to to have a greater sense of attention to detail for for yourself on a natural basis and then with regard to your UX practice. Number two. I refer to number two, I like to call it the art of pushing back. And again, say this is not a personality trait. It is a principle. It's something we need to do. Now, some people are saying, well, Darren, what in the world is pushing back? Pushing back is basically, and I remember when I first heard the phrase push back, and I had no idea what anybody was talking about. And I just sat back and I observed, and it actually took me a little bit to understand. I didn't ask anybody what it meant. I just watched people do it. And I came into the knowledge of what pushing back was. And I eventually came to know and understand that pushing back is a critical aspect of UX. Remember, we are not order takers. We don't sit and listen to what people are talking about they want to do or what they need to do, what they're claiming, and then just go do it. When somebody presents something to us, we need to investigate. We need to validate whether or not we should be going in a particular direction. And along with that, We always have to learn how to fight our battles. Pick your battles, I should say. Uh, Rephrasing that, got to say it the right way. We need to learn how to pick our battles. Don't just, every time something comes up that you don't agree with or something is incorrect, you don't have to point out every little flaw. You don't have to, to stand up for every little thing. We need to be selective. That's where critical thinking comes in. We need to say, okay, why am I going to to labor for this recommendation more so than another recommendation. Well, basically speaking, and as an example of where you might push back more, you can do, say, a heuristic evaluation. And when you complete that heuristic evaluation, the expert evaluation, some people call it, or a usability audit, some people call it. When you do that, you need to then, after you have a list of your findings, you need to prioritize the findings. And so some things are more critical, that red finding. Some things, they're uh, it's an issue, but it's not as critical as the red items. We call, I look at those as the yellow items. And I usually code things when I'm doing a heuristic analysis of red, yellow, and green. Green is a finding, but it can wait. It's something that we're not pressed for time. The, The degree of criticality associated with it is not very high. And so that's where the art of pushing back and p- picking your, your battles is more critical because it's based on priority. So if you see something that's an issue, for example, 
in a design and say it's accessibility related. It's going to create an accessibility issue, which is going to be a problem for users. It could potentially result in the company being sued because something was not accessible to a certain class of people or people with, with a certain challenge in their life. In, in life, you need to be aware of that. So I'm going to push. People are saying, well, we can't do that. We don't have time. Now, remember, we're not order takers. So I need to really press the issue. That's what pushing back is. Everybody's going in one direction or a stakeholder is going in one direction and you need to push back. You need to try to get them to change direction. Uh, and so you're going to provide evidence. You're going to, to provide recommendation. You're going to try to convince them. And that's what pushing back is. Is pushing back always successful? No, it's not. You can push back and people still won't listen. It's possible that that might happen, but that doesn't change the fact that we need to recognize when we have to push back. We need to recognize which battles we need to fight. We need to recognize it's an art. Making sure that you're not making people feel small, making sure that you're not being condescending, making sure that you're being respectful, making sure that you're demonstrating that, that you're committed to mutual professional respect. You're letting folks know that we shouldn't go in the direction that somebody's trying to get us to go. And a lot of times the majority may be trying to get you to go in a particular direction. But when you push back, you're letting people know, no, we shouldn't do that. And this is why. Yes, we actually should do this. And this is why. And there's an art to it because when you push back successfully, even if they don't do what you're recommending, you haven't burned any bridges. You haven't made any enemies. That's why it's an art. You have to be diplomatic. You have to be professional. You have to be respectful. You have to be informative. And even if they don't listen, it's still an opportunity to help drive the U.S. maturity level because you're communicating with people, you're educating people and letting people know why you're making this recommendation. So again, even if they don't follow through, even if they don't, they don't agree, they don't cooperate, that's still something that you can build on an opportunity where you can build that relationship that helps that the next time you push back, maybe you'll be more successful. So we must learn to push back and it is an art. Number three, don't be married to your work. I was talking to somebody on LinkedIn recently. Somebody gave a post and, or put up a post and they were talking about how we shouldn't, when, when we do work, they were saying, they were talking about how latched on we might be, how emotionally tied we are to the work that we've done. And, and I, I mentioned, I replied to that post, and, and it hit me that I need to include it in this segment, that we're not supposed to be emotionally tied to our work. If, if you are emotionally tied to the recommendations that you give to your prototype, to your wireframes, to whatever it is, to you, you've done all this great research and you present it and, and, and people are saying, well, you know, and, and this happens, folks. I know you did all this great research and I appreciate it, but now nah, we're not going that way. Well, we're not married to our work. It's, it's our job not to necessarily change minds. It's to present information so that we can, we can, be the person that we've got to advocate for users. We need to serve as an expert voice. We don't just give opinions. We give expert opinions. And when we do these things, we need to understand that it doesn't mean that people are going to cooperate, that they're going to listen to you or implement what you've presented. We need to know and understand that. And when it doesn't go in our favor, that's okay. Were you a proper advocate for the users? Did you represent expert voice? Did you demonstrate the integrity of the discipline and represent the discipline of user experience properly? If you did, you have done your job and they rejected what you presented and they're doing their job <laughs> and we own the user experience, but we don't control the user experience. I know some people don't like that, but that's that's the way it is. So don't be married to your work. It allows you to maintain your sanity. It helps you to continue building relationships. It helps you to properly represent the discipline. And so when somebody doesn't 
embrace what you have to say. Just, okay, I did my job, and you move on to the next initiative. That's just the way we're supposed to be, folks. So this is a principle that we need to embrace. And a lot of people would be a lot happier if they knew this earlier on. So if you didn't know it before, you didn't know, but now you know. So let's let's get to doing the right thing with regard to when our work gets rejected. Next, we need to be tool agnostic. Uh, somebody saying, what does that mean? Well, that means that we're not dependent on a particular tool, that our success is not dependent upon Figma versus Adobe XD or dependent upon Adobe XD versus Figma or dependent upon Axure versus InVision or dependent upon InVision as opposed to Axure. We are, and the discipline is tool agnostic. Now, a lot of practitioners are not tool agnostic and that's because they simply haven't arrived at that point yet. They haven't reached that level of personal UX maturity yet. But if you want to thrive, you need to make sure you're not overly tied to any tool because the, the most important tool, as I always say, is actually the human mind. And see, once we learn or we understand how to achieve our goals using a tool, if they took that tool away, could you still do your job? Could you still excel? Think about it. A tool has affordances. Any tool that you like, any tool that you are are. It, it you have a it's your favorite. You you may like XD uh, better than other tools. You might like Envision better than other tools. You might like Figma better than other tools. I mean the list goes on and on and on of your your more preeminent design tools, if you will. But really, what affordances are provided through that tool? What does that tool allow you to do? And that's where our mind should be. So that way, even though you can have a, you have a favorite, and you can have a favorite, no problem, no problem with that whatsoever. We'll, we'll always have something. I, I have tools that I prefer. You have tools. You, everybody has tools that they prefer. But if you're going to be successful, you need to have more of an affordance mindset than to be locked into that tool because things can change in a heartbeat. And then what? A, a lot of people are unaware of the fact that. Back in 2006, roughly, the the big enterprise design tool back in 2006 was a tool called iRise. A lot of people have absolutely no idea what iRise is, and that's part of where I'm going with this. People were putting down six figures because you had to buy a server in order to do your work. You couldn't just buy the software. You had to get a server and have it at work to run all of your all your prototypes on. So companies were putting down 100K just to implement iRise within their organizations. Now, when you look at that, as I said, that's 2006. It wasn't too much long longer after that that Axure came out. So you have one tool. And that tool costs your company, every time it's implemented, 100K. Axure comes along, and it's roughly $400. And if and if you were a student at the time and you had good grades, they had a program at Axure that would allow you to get a free license to Axure based on your the fact that you had that you were a good student. But here's the, the kicker. Axure's $400, so... Which one, which one do you think a company is going to opt for? So Axure comes along, and, and Justin Mine was already out there. Um, the Balsamic was already out there. But they didn't have that enterprise. Neither one of them had uh, an enterprise following. It, what, neither one was a type of thing, although Balsamic did in some cases. I've, I've seen that in enterprise before. But when you are focused on iRise, and yet... This Axure comes out, if you're not one who embraces the affordance mentality, those people will have a more difficult time transitioning to the other tool. Now, does that make sense? I, I certainly hope so because, I mean, it's not just that. I mean, iRise got supplanted with a lot of people by Axure. Um, 
it was a few years later, Sketch comes along. And when Sketch comes along, that was about the same time that the siege took place. So the siege came along about started around 2011, 2012, about the same time the boot camps started. Not too long after that, the siege upon UX came in the in the full play. And you had people that were trying to transition into UX. They weren't interested in creating uh, prototypes, ex- extremely interactive and complex prototypes in Axure. It, it was more of a visual design thing. And, and it was less about representing every aspect of the experience. It was more about trying to present something uh, really, a lot of times that just look great. And so that's when Sketch hit its heyday. Sketch, a lot of people were, tra- again, transitioning in from being developers, being visual designers, and they took a liking to Sketch. A lot of them did not go to Axure and then to Sketch. A lot of people went straight to Sketch. So Sketch started off with this huge following, and everybody's just paying attention and loving on Sketch and thinking Sketch is the best thing since sliced bread. But then you fast forward a few years and along comes Adobe XD and along comes Figma. And a lot of the people who were in Sketch, many of which, again, had transitioned into the discipline, are now they're over here looking at Adobe XD and and looking at Figma. And Figma right now is probably the most popular tool of its kind in, in, in the market today. Uh, and in another three, four years, something else is liable to come along and it's going to supplant Figma. The only way that you're going to excel with the minimal amount of downtime is to, to make sure you understand the affordances. Matter of fact, that's why people love the tools that they do because they love the affordances. They love that this application allows me to do X, Y, and Z, and the other one either doesn't do it or it makes me do it in a different way that I'm not really fond of. So, But the affordances help us to translate between application. If you're trying to learn more tools today, because I tell people all the time, don't just be caught up with one tool. Expose yourself to more than one tool. You might be using one at work. You might have a favorite or a couple of favorites, but that should not keep you from developing knowledge and understanding and some level of skill with regard to other tools. That is in your best interest. It's in your team's best interest. I mean, really, at your job, they might be using one team, one tool today, and they can turn around and start using another tool in a year. You just don't know. So make sure that you're very affordance minded, and that will help you. So that's how you be- help. That helps you, I should say, become tool agnostic, and you're in a better position to succeed. Next, you want to develop a filter. You want to be the kind of person that is that knows how to, another critical thinking statement, we want to be the kind of people who can see something, hear something, and then apply critical thinking and be able to, you want to be able to ascribe the accurate amount of value and trustworthiness on what you're being exposed to. Now, this is something that when people come into UX, they just flat out don't have. For the most part, most people, especially people who are more zealous, zeal, that energy tends to override some things. It, it overrides critical thinking a lot of times and people just embrace something and they think that it's OK. They think that it's trustworthy. They think it's reliable, but that's not it. I mean, in, in my doctoral studies, that's something that we have to do. We have to identify whether or not something is trustworthy, whether or not something is reliable. And you put it through the ringer. And only when something is proven to be trustworthy and reliable, do you embrace it. That's something that I wish more people would understand that that is a critical skill to have in general as a UX professional. And so when you, the more of a critical eye you have, the more discerning you are and the more accurate you are in that discernment, that is going to immediately feed into your practice as a user experience professional and make you a better representative of the discipline and and you're going to function better within the discipline because you know what you can put your stamp of approval on and what you need to reject. A lot of people don't have that skill, which is why a lot of people misinformation, as I often mentioned, was not common at all. It was practically non-existent prior to 2011 
Now it's everywhere and people don't have the filter, but it's not just the filter they don't have. People are not, they a lot of people just do not have an interest in critical thinking whatsoever. Not only does that make them more prone to embracing misinformation, but it also makes a person less prepared and less able to optimize their design work because it, it's applicable there as much as it is in navigating around the whirlpools today, uh, the whirlwinds, I should say, of misinformation. So, so these types of things are critical. Make sure that you work on develop, developing a filter. Start looking at something, validating it. Okay, they said X, Y, and Z. Is X really true? Is there any supportive documentation for that? Not just are there articles. Don't be these people who just go to Google and then look something up. And because you see it, you think it's legit because it comes up in the search results. It comes up in the search results for a reason. That's not a truth meter You're not going to validate things. That's something we have to do individually. Examine something to see whether or not it be so. Check to see if it's true. Check to see if it is reliable. Look for validation. Look for proof of a thing and then hold on to it. You'll be better off for it. I mean, after all, isn't that what you're proving to try to help stakeholders to know that they should go in a certain direction, that they should listen to the recommendations that you're providing? They're doing it, but you won't. So so that that's the ethical aspect of of UX that comes into play. We, we, we want people to listen to us, but we won't listen to other people. Okay, so that, that needs to know that if that's you today, again, that doesn't mean you're a bad UXer. That means you can be better. Look, Let's look at this again. It's getting better. Uh, realize, you know what? I have not had my critical thinking hat on. I have not made a point to identify what's trustworthy and what's reliable, and I have been eating anything that's been set before me. Let's not do that today. Develop a filter. Next, number six, and there's going to be some bonus items on number eight, just telling you now. Learn to be, be courageous. Embrace, I should say. Embrace courage. I, I often say that in UX today, and has been for quite some time, there's a lot of, of cowardice. <laughs> it just flat out is. People are afraid. They don't want to tell people. I mean, and think about the pushing back component that I mentioned. Some people can't push back because they're afraid to. Some people can't give somebody constructive criticism because they're afraid to. Somebody can't tell someone that if we roll out this design, we're going to take a major hit if we do because I see problems with it and here are the 10 problems I see. Some people can't do that. I got my first full-time user experience job because I was willing to be courageous. I embraced courage and, and they asked me to critique the company's website and I did and I didn't hold anything back. And that's how I got the job because I didn't hold back. I didn't hold anything back. And please know there's a difference between brute, just being brutally honest and being diplomatic. There's a difference between being diplomatic and being politically correct. And But we have to have courage today because a lot of people, I catch it a lot because people are angry with me because I am courageous. I am willing to say what needs to be said. I, I had a post recently on social media and somebody said, you know, Darren, you're saying what a bunch of us are thinking. We just haven't said it. I've had people that have contacted me. They said, I'm glad you're willing to say it because I'm I'm willing to admit that I'm not willing to say it. So I'm thankful for you. So that, this type of thing, we need more courage in user experience. And one of the reasons that the discipline is in the current tailspin that it's in is to a large part. It It is related to the lack of, of courage that we have in the discipline today because people are, it's funny, they're unwilling to stand up for what they need to stand up for, but then some of the same people will stand up for something that they should have been rejecting because politically correct, that mindset to be politically correct is more important to them than to embrace the ethics of the discipline and, and to represent it the way that it deserves to be represented. So if you know that you've lacked courage, if you know that you've been afraid to say and do certain things, dig deep. Make it a point to change that. You know if you've been a coward or not. You know if you've chickened out 
with certain things. You know if, if the back's got a little bit of jelly, your spine, I should say, has a little bit of jelly in it. You know that. So take a, learn how to take a stand. And you'll learn how to be able to do it without ruffling feathers unnecessarily. We're not, we're not talking about being agitative. That's not courage. That's not courage. Some people will say that I'm being agitated when I say certain things. No, I'm just willing to say what needs to be said, and I'm not afraid to say it. So you know, if people want to, they want to punish me for taking a stand, you know, so be it. I, that, I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to become them. I'm certainly not going to be a coward about the thing. But I know what's at stake, and we need to be better than this. And you can't just, folks can't leave being courageous up to a scant few people. So I hope somebody is willing to to join the, the parade with that. I've started to see more people willing to speak up, and I, and I say something to them when I see it. Thank you for speaking up, because you can't leave me out here by myself. <laughs> you can't leave me out here by myself in many instances doing exactly this. I know other people that are willing to take a stand, but a lot of people, they're they're afraid, and then they try to make you feel bad because you're not afraid. Uh, not afraid for a reason. That means I'm not going to back down from you. So we have some other stories to tell about that another time. Number seven, commit to relearning. This is something, again, it's something that's really going to help us. Just because you learned about something two years ago, three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, it needs to be revisited. We talked about this on a recent on a recent episode. We need to understand the things that you feel like you have a good handle on. It doesn't mean that you've, you've tapped out. It doesn't mean that you don't have anything else about that you can learn. Take the things that you feel that you have a good solid grip on and study it anyway. You're you're going to find something that's going to drive you to higher heights and deeper depths. You're going to find something that's going to help you, your users, benefit you, your users, and your your team, and your, and your, your company, and your brand immensely. So just be willing. What, what For example, what was the last book that you not necessarily read, but but spent a great deal of time in? Because sometimes we don't finish the books. We get in, we get what we need, we get out, we go. We're, we're done with it, and we'll revisit it later. Truth be told, that's what a lot of us do. But you looked at that, say you looked at that three years ago. Do you realize you've changed over the course of that three years? So if you've changed over the course of that three years, five years, whatever it is, one year for that matter, six months, you've changed, you've grown, you've matured. Your vision is sharper. Your discernment is better. Your your room for error has decreased. So go and look at that thing, that same topic, that video, that 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 talk that you saw, whatever it is, that book that you that you dove into, go and look at it again. Guarantee you, you're gonna see things from a different perspective, and it's gonna help you to grow. So do not underestimate the power of relearning something. It is invaluable. And our last point, which has a few subpoints, seven of them to be exact, and this is one that's probably gonna ruffle some feathers, but that's okay. Some, somebody's going to appreciate it and somebody's going to embrace it and somebody's going to be better for it. But point number eight, we sort of touched on this a little bit already. Please get some scruples. <laughs> uh, like Just like uh, uh, we talked about courage, scruples is lacking in UX. I had a conversation with somebody, not a very fun conversation, but there was a person who went to share some information on social media And they said, they made a statement. I'm not going to say what the statement was, but they made a statement as if the topic that was being presented is something that nobody talks about. I've seen a few people that present something and this is how they do it. Nobody is talking about the sky. And let me tell you some things about the sky that they're not talking about. And then they start talking about things that are like some of the first things you should learn when you're learning about user experience. Now, so I called the person out. I said, well, this is not, these things are not uncommon. Matter of fact, not not only are they not uncommon, um, these things are like basic things. 
that people should learn and are learning. I personally talk to people about it a lot. I know people who talk about these things on a regular basis. So why would you paint a picture to the user experience community that this thing is a topic that's not getting any coverage? It was simply not true. And the person said, came back and they said, well, it's not true for you. It might be common for you, but just because it's common for you doesn't mean it's common for other people. I mean, most of my audience is new, U, new UX uh, professionals anyway. And I'm like, what? Who said that I said that because that's how I view it? I don't say anything because it's how I view it. I say it because, as we already said, I've already proven things out. I've already done research. I've had hundreds of conversations about these same topics. I've been looking at these things for years, and then it hit me. And I went back and I looked at the person's LinkedIn profile. And when I looked at the profile, what I feared and what I began to suspect, I found out that it was accurate. This person had zero work experience in UX. This person maybe went to some class or something somewhere and then immediately thought that they knew what they needed to know to go out and start practicing UX, which was it was proven that they couldn't because nobody hired them. So then they said that they had their own business. So if that's what you're going to do, that's fine. You can do that and even and even get business. And I wish you all the best if you're going to do that. But that doesn't give you the right to repre- misrepresent the, yourself or the discipline. You're out there, ha- you have a following, and you haven't worked in UX a day in your life. The person has never been hired. Okay, you you said that you got a company. Who Who has hired you? Has anybody really, has any real organization with a tax ID number brought you in and paid you to do work? Have you worked at a startup? Have you worked at a at, at a, 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 uh, any other business? Have you worked Fortune 1000? Have you worked for anybody and, and then worked long enough to make observations, draw conclusions, do some critical thinking, arrive at some con- some conclusions, come up with some information that's worth worth being shared out to the masses. Have you done any of those things? The answer was no. And, and what was interesting was this person wanted to stand toe to toe with me, who had to be twenty eight years of experience this year, and that person had zero. But they wanted to stand toe to toe with me and talk about what their following expected. Folks, there's a lot of folks that don't have scruples. They just don't. That was completely unethical what that person's doing. Again, I've seen several people do that before. If you don't have the experience, would you let somebody do your hair just because they had some utensils and some clippers or a little bit of hair dye or something? Would you let somebody work on your car just because they had some wrenches? Would you let somebody pull your teeth just because they had because uh, they they had an interest in dentistry? Would you let somebody work on your plumbing because they had a, a couple of wrenches? Would you let somebody work on your car because they had a passion for cars? You don't, folks. Just because somebody was in the vicinity of UX doesn't mean that they have anything of note and and scruples in all of the examples I just mentioned. You want to engage with someone that has scruples. If you do not, you are at risk. Misinformation, being misled, tainting your own name. There's a lot of issues when there's a lack of scruples. So here are your your seven, yep, make sure I'm counting them correctly, seven issues associated with scruples and illustrating the importance of why you need them. When you get scruples, it helps you recognize scruples. A lot of people don't value scruples because really, I guess they haven't been burned enough by people who don't have scruples or they just weren't taught scruples. A lot of people were just jerks as kids and they just became jerk adults. They perfected their jerkiness. And so when people don't have scruples, they don't have respect for scruples. When people don't have scruples, point number two they don't respect scruples with other people. Like it takes game, game recognizes game. It applies to scruples too. But when people recognize integrity and they value it, 
when people recognize truth and they value it, uh, that means that the person has scruples. And those are the kind of people you want to surround yourself with because those are the kind of people that are really going to help to get things done. They're not going to be stealing time away at work. They're not going to be coming in late and leaving early. They're they're not going to lie to clients and stakeholders. They're not going to misrepresent things just to get their way. Scruples are critical. So again, you need scruples to recognize scruples and you need scruples to help you respect other people who have scruples. People who don't respect folks who have scruples, that's a sign that they don't have any scruples and it's a matter of time before you become uh, a fixture in their crosshairs, quite frankly. Um, getting scruples helps you to embrace accountability, which is also something that's lacking tremendously in the discipline today. And accountability really helps drive folks forward. Accountability is that that key element associated with constructive criticism. For example, when, when you give somebody constructive criticism and they have the scruples and they're willing to embrace accountability, they hear what you say and they improve. They hear what you say and they get better, which technically is point number four, because if you have scruples, you won't take constructive criticism personally. A lot of people, when they hear constructive criticism, they take it personally, and now they turn around. A lot of times they turn around and attack the source of the constructive criticism instead of saying, you know what, that's correct. You know what, I could improve there. You know what? That's right. I do need to do that. I'm going to I'm going to start working on that. And and when you you ever met anybody that you heard look at yourself. Times that you receive uh, constructive criticism and you take it and look at the 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 bounds you're able to leap after that. Look at the improvement that you achieve after that. Look at all the success you have after that. So nobody's being personal when they call you out for something that was done wrong. They're calling out something that needs to be said. They're calling out something that needs to be given greater consideration. And if we do it, we're better off for it. So scruples will help you respond the right way instead of having a hissy fit and and starting to have a temper tantrum, which is what uh, people who don't have scruples do when, when, they get, when they get checked. Having scruples helps build viable relationships with clients and stakeholders. Stakeholders want to deal with people that are not going to take them for a ride, that are not going to mislead them, that are going to support their initiatives. Clients don't want, they don't want to pay a company that they can't trust. So scruples is really critical. That's why I always talk about integrity and ethics being a key part of successful UX operation because of that. I mean, how are you going to build relationships with somebody that, and they can't trust you? How are you going to build a relationship with somebody and they don't know when you're telling the truth and when you're not? They don't know what to do with the words that are coming out of your mouth. There needs to be a trust factor there. That's one of, I love Patrick Lencioni's five dysfunctions of, of a team. And the, the first element of dysfunction that he calls out is that of trust. If you do, can't build trust, if there is no trust, then the dysfunction is going to take over. Now you've got a toxic work environment. You've got a hostile work environment. You've got a hostile team. And, and that's something that nobody enjoys, ironically, except for the people who are the perps. The perps like it. But outside of that, nobody likes toxic work environments. It's just, it's not fun. It's not beneficial. And it will drain you. It can kill you. It actually can. So, and that point, go on to the, the next one. It I already mentioned it. It helps earn trust. So sort of building on the, the relationship piece is that trust must be earned. So when people see a constant demonstration of integrity, when people see that they can believe what you're saying, when people see data that proves the viability of your operation and the authority with which you operate, trust becomes earned. And, and when trust is earned, that's when the relationship kicks in the play and you want some longevity, you want some brand loyalty, you want some customer loyalty, build some trust, build some trust, but you can't build trust, not genuine trust, unless you develop some scruples. So get some scruples. And the last point, and we'll wrap up on this one, getting scruples will keep you from building these faux social media personalities 
and will help distance you from celebritism. Celebritism, that example that I gave earlier, these people are trying to develop followings. People are trying to make themselves out to be someone that everybody should want to hear. They try to present themselves as someone that's making contributions. They present themselves as if what they have to say has value. And a lot of people, they're presenting content that they stole from somewhere else. They're repurposing things. They they say things like the example I gave earlier. They act like nobody is saying this, but I am. Uh, no, a lot of people have been saying it the whole time. And I have confronted people about that before. And, and sometimes they act like they're thanking you, but really they don't. And, and they're looking for you to say something else. I've had people steal content from me. I had somebody once. I saw somebody, I should say, take someone's exact post on LinkedIn, not mine, but someone else's, take an exact post of another individual, post it as if it was their own. And, and then when I called, I called the person out. I was so offended for the other person that I reached out to the person who stole the content. And first they made a comment. They ended up deleting it. And they tried to act like they were thanking me for calling that out. That's just flat out plagiarism. So I'm like, okay, they blew me off. And that's when I will just flat out expose a person. And I took a screenshot of that person's post, a screenshot of the person's post, the originator of the post. I put them side by side and showed everybody what people are doing out here. It, it is It is amazing that people will do things like that and act like, it's okay. Like, it's not a big deal. They just steal the content and they want to get likes. And as if they're getting paid for the likes, it it's just utterly ridiculous. So scruples are critical. If you embrace them, if you have them, you're not trying to build a false following out there. You're not really trying to build a following at all. Uh, you're not you're you're not trying to be a UX celebrity. Nobody gets anything from that. So scruples are critical. And if we're going to have a better UX community, if we're going to have a more beneficial UX community, if we're going to have a healthy UX community, these eight traits plus these, these seven bonus items that I presented in conjunction with scruples, we need to start seeing these more and, and make yourself a committee of one to make sure you're going to embrace these things and you'll find how beneficial it is to carry yourself in conjunction with these things. So, folks, that's it. That's all we got for today. These are eight under-the-radar principles for UX professionals. I hope you take it to heart. So that's all the time we have for today. Thanks again, everyone, for taking the time to listen to the podcast. But until next time, this is Darren Hood the host of The World of UX, signing off. Happy UXing, everybody. Thanks for joining us for this session of CX of M Radio. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and visit cxofm.org for more resources.